What's going on, everyone? Thomas Jordan here for another episode. Today, we are joined by personal trainer, food connoisseur, and a recent guest on national TV's TBS Rat in the Kitchen, Ben Johnson. What's going on, man? Nothing much. How are you doing, my dude? Dude, I'm doing great. How did you get started in the fitness industry? So the the biggest thing, because I think a lot of people uh, probably assume that most people in fitness have just like always been fit and looked great. And then they're just like, oh, I can make a career out of this. And for me, it's, it's not that at all. And I think for a lot of people in fitness, it's not the case. I was like a natural chubster growing up. I was the sort of kid who would like look at a piece of chocolate cake and gain weight. Uh, and then, you know, over time of kind of being the chubby kid, I was kind of like, ah, I don't really want to be that anymore. And it was especially in, in late high school, early college that I started to kind of take fitness into my own hands, actually start exercising, start paying attention to what I was eating. And then that kind of just snowballed from there. And the biggest thing, like, yeah, there were tons of physical transformations and I ended up looking a lot better at the end of it, but that was kind of just like a nice cherry on top. The biggest changes happened within. I, I transformed as a person thanks to fitness. And so I got into coaching to essentially help other people have similarly powerful transformations and fitness being a catalyst for that. And really it's about like personal growth, personal development, becoming a better human and just happening to do so through fitness. So that was I mean, kind of the, the short story of it, but natural chubster turned fitness professional um, because it, it changed me. And what was, what would you say was the catalyst where you were like, okay, I need to make a change now? Well, that's, that's the funny thing. Cause everyone like talks about like, what it will find your why my why as a freshman in college was to have a more exciting social life. There was a girl I was interested in and I was like, you know what, if I'm more fit, uh, I'll probably be able to get her attention better. Um, and you know, we ended up dating. So I guess I did a decent job in that yeah. regard, but what's interesting <laughs> is like what gets you started doesn't matter nearly as much as what keeps you going. So by the time like meaningful change happened for me. It was kind of like, Oh, I like, you know, it was, it was nice that I ended up getting the girl, so to speak. But what was more powerful than that was that I was able to like actually make changes. And then I got caught up in the process rather than just the outcomes. So then it was, it was easy to stick with it. And over the long haul is where big meaningful changes actually happened. So it was kind of like a, I guess, you know, shallow or vain reason to get started, but ultimately it, it was transformative. So who cares? Like, I don't know. I think a lot of people judge, they're like, well, that's not a very good reason. I just want to look great this summer. It's like, that's a great reason. Go for it. Like, it, you know, do whatever is calling to you. Yeah. And that's the thing. And did you, I mean, when did you, st and then when I'm trying to think is usually, like I said, and you said, yeah, it is like a quote unquote vain reason, but I think a lot of people, I don't know, no matter what the reason is, see, cause I had the exact opposite problem. I was like super skinny in high school oh, and like, I had like teachers come up to me and think I was like sick. So, and then <laughs> Here, I kind of had this sandwich. Yeah. Right. And then my met so a friend of a friend and we became friends. And then he was like, Hey man, do you want to go to the gym? And it's so funny because I thought to myself, it was like gym class, right? I never thought right. about working out and started doing that. And then kind of what happened to you, they, uh, and then he inter, um, he introduced me to like the college life. Like we went down to like Auburn, Auburn, Alabama. Oh, sure. And that was like, I didn't know that world existed. And then I noticed all these dudes are all, all his friends are in the gym, like working out and they're hanging out with girls. And I'm just like, yeah. Oh, so if you do that, we do that. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's like all yeah. the dots. Yes. Yeah. Um, but getting started, I feel like in, even with the clients now that you have, do you feel like getting started is the hardest part? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's often the hardest part. And if not that, it's like the humility to like own the fact that we don't know everything. Um, Cause I think a lot of people, whether it's like, Oh, well, I played high school football, so I know how to work out. Like, well, that was, that was 20 years ago, Robert, like maybe we need to like get, get a refresher or, or just accepting that like there are people that know more than me and can be helpful. Uh, Cause it's, it's really just hard to go it alone. So like getting started is definitely very challenging, like overcoming inertia and getting things going. Uh, but I also think the humility aspect that is kind of required in doing new things and, you know, just owning the fact that you're going to kind of suck at fitness for a bit. And that that's actually totally fine. And part of the process, because that's how you learn and develop and, and get better. So if, you know, if all we're ever doing is doing what we're comfortable with, uh, odds are we're not going to like stretch and grow. And I think that gets lost a lot. So in, in some ways, yeah, like getting started is super challenging for sure. 
Uh, but I think we make it more challenging because we're trying to hold ourselves to like a standard of perfection rather than letting ourselves kind of suck and ease into it. We're trying to be the, the like hero at the gym right off the bat, which no one can be. So yeah, it's kind of like a, a one, two punch of the two of those in my opinion. Yeah. And do you think, and I know along with fitness, um, whether it's weightlifting, P90X, yoga, whatever you want to do, they say, I feel like it's like an industry standard that it's like an 80, 80, 20 rule when it comes to actual fitness versus the food aspect. Uh, do you agree that it's like 80% in the kitchen versus the 20% in the, uh, in the gym? I actually don't. Um, and that, that could maybe like, uh, you know, raise, raise some ears, I suppose. Um, but the reason why is like both are important, but I would say 100% of the aesthetic change that we're making has to do with what we're eating. So that 80, 20, like in a lot of ways, there's a lot of validity to it. Um, but ultimately it comes down to what we're eating. So if we're trying to lose fat, it kind of doesn't matter what we're doing in the gym. We need to be eating in a way that supports that goal. Or even on the flip side, if we're trying to gain muscle, the gym is all the more important because we need to stimulate growth. But even if we're stimulating that growth, we have to fuel it with what we're eating. So I, I kind of, uh, I kind of, I tend to say that nutrition is 100% of the sort of change we make. Mind you, for the sake of general health, exercise is important. But if we're trying to like chase after a specific scale goal, scale related goal, or even uh, gaining size, losing fat, those types of things, like nutrition really makes or breaks it. No, I, I actually totally agree. Cause it's interesting. You say a hundred percent. Cause I say 90, 10, because like in the re and the whole reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is because that's part of, uh, that, or it's going to be almost like pillar number one in my program. Like I'm mm -hmm. teaching people all about like podcasting interviews and things like that, but also to have like one of the pillars is presence. Like you have to have a presence and in, uh, in, and I, and I talk about it a little bit where I've read when I was doing research, uh, for like just research and development for this thing, I noticed a lot of people did not want to be on camera. Like they start podcasts mm -hmm. to, so you don't have to be on camera. Um, but some of the stories just kind of like made me choke up a little bit. Cause like some people, and you've probably been there too, or just, and I can attest to this as well for myself are just so mean to ourselves. Like yeah. the internet can be mean, but I have said some vile stuff to myself, like for in the sure. mirror, just like your subconscious or whatever. And that's kind of where it hit me. And then I went on a whole transformation and learned to, like, I just started walking and then, you know, I've always been kind of into fitness, but I hit that, you know, that peak of where, you know, where I was just telling you, I got up to like 220, which is way like I said, I took the quarantine 15 times 10 yeah. and I lost 61 pounds in six months. It would have been five, but it was six months. And just all I did was walk. And of course I lifted or whatever, uh, ate more protein, drank more water. And I just found a way to like make food fun. And mm -hmm. like it started cause I have a gnarly sweet tooth. So I started to mix protein <laughs> with like trying to make protein brownies and you know, stuff like that. And it, it just really started to help. And like, I, and I think a lot of people can agree, like if anybody's been on any type of fitness journey, I feel like everybody yo-yos at some point. Right. And I've just yo-yoed forever. I've tried everything. I've tried keto. I've tried paleo, the whole 30 carnivore, da, 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 da. But inter I landed on intermittent fasting because I have such a big appetite, but I'm Same. telling you, man, as soon as you just like almost make food fun and tracking like a game, it completely changed everything. And I saw how easy it was. And then started to compare it to like what you see on TV and these fitness shows, like the biggest loser and stuff like that. And you see what they're doing. And to be honest, it, it, it sounds, it looks awful. Like if I, right. if you had me running shuttle sprints and like lifting weight, that's awful. Like I'm sitting here like walking, like I'm on a Sunday drive, right. Or a Sunday walk and just consistently hitting that number. But yeah, I like how you said it, it's a hundred percent in the kitchen versus like the 90, 10. Cause yeah. like you could, cause you could do anything like whether it's lifting P90X, insanity. I mean, all yoga, whatever you bar, whatever you want, ballet, whatever you want to do. If, but if you're 
if you had the right numbers of calories and stuff like that, it's you, you could do nothing and you would drop exactly. weight like that. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with people that are, I mean, all sorts of ages, but someone that's maybe uh, lives a more sedentary lifestyle and is in their sixties and, you know, isn't going to go crush it at the gym because of course not. So just, yeah, do whatever you feel good doing. We'll handle the nutrition and we'll still help you succeed with whatever your goals are. Cause ultimately weight loss comes down to being in a caloric deficit. So that just means consuming fewer calories than you're burning each day. And as long as you're doing that on a consistent basis, you're going to lose weight. And now you can burn some more calories through exercise, but it's not a super efficient means of just burning calories. It's great for general health. It's great for longevity. It's great for all sorts of things, but burning calories, not really the most efficient way to do it. So like, yeah, you can go slog on a treadmill for 45 minutes and burn a few hundred calories. Awesome. You can also just not eat a bagel and it's, you know, that takes 15 seconds rather than 45 minutes. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it makes life easier. And what I love about the, the explanation you were just giving of kind of your, your recent adventure with fitness is that rather than trying to fit yourself into some box of like the carnivore diet or this, that, or the other, you kind of leaned into what works for you. And you made the, the food fun. You made fitness in general fun. You had to meet you where you're at and move forward from there. And that's, I think, the, the real like key to unlocking success for everybody. And like my job as a coach is helping people find what that thing is because like everything can work. It's a matter of what finding what, what's going to work best for the individual. And that's really where the magic happens. So for you, you have this, this sweet tooth and a big appetite. It makes sense that something like intermittent fasting would be a good fit because you're able to kind of indulge that larger appetite by say skipping breakfast and having a bigger lunch and dinner, you're like more satisfied by doing that. You don't feel restricted or at least as restricted. It helps you stay on track with that caloric deficit. That's going to fuel the progress you want anyway. And so it makes it almost easy. Whereas doing something like whole 30 is maybe white knuckling it for 30 days. And it's, it's challenging. And I, you know, there are some people where whole 30 probably feels great and awesome. And the way the intermittent fasting and indulging that sweet tooth has felt for you. And that's really the key for, for everyone is if we can find ways to make food and fitness for that matter, fun for ourselves as an individual, that, that makes it easy rather than like, all right, I got to go do this thing. I hate in order to make the progress I want. That's, that's short-term thinking. That's, I mean, maybe you'll make progress, but eventually you're going to want to go back to normal life. And then all that progress is gone. And what good is progress? If it doesn't last, it's not worth much in my opinion. Yeah. And it's interesting because I know like the fitness industry has been, I mean, there's just so much info out there. Like I can already hear it now. It's like, Oh, it has to do with height, weight. You have to get some, like, it's not all about the, like, is, I don't know, dude. I mean, my aunt, I got my aunt on it. She like ran, I was telling her about my progress. She's 75 years old. She can't, I can't remember. She can't, I don't know what it's called, but she can't have gluten and celiac. That's it. And then yeah. she's got like some knee issues and back issues. So she can't even walk. So I told her, I was like, when we're on the phone, just walk around. Right. And if you're going to walk up and down the stairs, just please hold on to the railing. Cause God right. forbid, if something happens, I yeah. don't, Thomas told Health me to walk up the stairs. First. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But she, and she doesn't, and she's kind of, she, <laughs> doesn't need a digital scale, dude. She uses like what it says on there, like teaspoon of this cup of that, which if you have a digital scale, you know that that's off a little bit, but sure. she track she tracks her stuff. I showed her how to do it with a number two pencil and a pad <laughs> of paper. And dude, she lost 15 pounds. And I tried to tell her that she, um, needed to fast or like, I was trying to convince her to fast. And she's like, no. And I had to remember, you've got to do what works for you. Yes. And she just figures out a way to do it. And I told her it, it's like a game. Like if you go yeah. out to, you know, cause she's like, oh, I'm going out to Mexican, uh, food for tonight. What do I do? I was like, get the fajitas. She's like, well, what about chips and salsa? I was like, well, take the chips. And just, if you have to have them, like I break them up into like four or five pieces. And like, it's like you trick your brain Stretches and get it, it out. Yeah. Yeah. Just to like, so you can get that hit that fix and trick your brain into it. And then it's like, you know, she's like, do I get guac? He's like the good fats. I was like, well, it depends how many calories you got left because right. yeah. too much of anything is still too much. Yes. So, but dude, she, and then I had, to, I had to slow her down. She's like, I think I'm going to lose a little bit more. I was like, no, I was like, stop, <laughs> you know, but she's yeah, she got has so much momentum. She was all fired up. 
Yeah. And like, she's got a thyroid issue and stuff. So it's like, I mean, she's crushing it, man. Yeah. And she, like I said, she's old school and just does it like that. Right. And, and she's made it fun too. She's like, Oh, I found a little hack and I'm like, Oh my God, she's getting into it too. And if you feel good that I feel like, and that's why I teach, I'm going to teach it my programs too, is because like, even after like, I'll be honest, after I've kind of fallen off the boat a little bit, but even after when I recorrect and like get back on it after about the third day, I feel like a completely different person. So yeah. I want to challenge everybody for like a week. Like I'm going to show them how to track, like where your number is, like just go away times 12, try it for a week, check with your doctor, make sure it's good. Like you're good. And then just try it for a week and then try to like figure it out. But yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And like you said, making it a game, but then not just a game, a game you can win because that that's, what's going to build momentum. And if we do something that feels impossible or something that you just like can't actually follow, then you're not going to feel the momentum build. And your, your aunt is a great example of like, once the momentum built, she got excited and wanted to do more. Whereas if she tried to do it all at once, she wouldn't have had, like, there would be no wind in her sails. So I, I think, yeah, that's, that's super cool. And then I love that she's, you know, tracking in, in a way that works for her, right? You don't have to be on an app like my fitness pal, meticulously logging everything specific to the gram you can, I mean, I think, I think tracking gets, uh, gets kind of blown out of proportion, like macros matter and paying attention to what we're eating matters. But if we're off by a few grams here and there, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Cause ultimately what the tracking is about is about being mindful about our habits and behaviors. It's a tool. It's a means to an end of better understanding the choices and decisions we're making around food, but it's not the end itself. And so often it's treated like the end itself. We bend over backwards so we can hit our numbers perfectly. And like those numbers might be helpful, uh, but more important than the numbers themselves is just making sure you find a way to be aware of your habits and behaviors around food. Because then when you have that awareness, the awareness can lead to action and action can lead to change and like meaningful change at that rather than just like, all right, well, I hit my calories for the day. I succeeded. It's like, well, well you know, it's whether or not you're hitting them every single day doesn't matter nearly as much as being aware of why you're maybe not hitting them some days and hitting them others. Cause that's where change really happens. And do you think the fitness industry demonizes tracking your calories? Uh, a, a certain part of it. Sure. And then another part of it absolutely glorifies it. And, and I think the truth is somewhere in the middle hmm. where, you know, it's not necessarily the end all be all of fitness. It's also not necessarily a bad thing. There are some people for whom it probably is a, a, like an un helpful practice. Um, but that's about individuals, right? There's always going to be different people, different strokes for different folks, so to speak. So for some people tracking might be a terrible idea for others. It's going to be a great idea to offer some specificity and structure, but there are ways to offer that same specificity structure and, and bring awareness to habits and behaviors that don't have to do with tracking for people that it maybe wouldn't serve them as well. Yeah. And dude, and I don't know, and I'm just finding this out recently. Cause like I, I told you, I turned it into a game and, uh, I remember cause it was interesting. Cause I know there was that, um, documentary on Netflix basically saying that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Oh, and sure. Like, yeah. And there's all like, that lovely misinformation out there. It's fun. Yeah. Well, dude, it's crazy because like I told you I had a sweet tooth, but once I started cooking those desserts that really didn't have, you know, it was like mixing protein with like Kodiak, uh, dark chocolate pancake mix. Right. And like, dude, I basically made like a brownie out of it. Right. Yeah. And I was like experimenting with different milks where I could like save calories. But after a while I noticed that like, I'd come over to my parents' house and she, my mom would be cooking like my favorite, like cupcakes and cookies. Right, right, right. And normally I'd indulge in that plus eat the cookie dough plus eat the cookies. But like, I just got in there and was like, it would, dude, it was bizarre because normally I would have mowed down like 3000 calories worth of sweets, but I sure. just sat there and looked at it on the table. I was like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, our, our taste buds literally change over time and that's not exactly my area of expertise as far as the science, but if we're not having sweets all the time, our, our ability to tolerate sweets for lack of a better term, uh, cause like tolerate sweets, they're delicious. It's fine. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, sweetness hits a lot harder if we're not having it all the time. So if we're eating, you know, largely vegetables and, and lean meats and things like that, you have a cookie and it's like, oh, wow, that was really sweet. You get like halfway through it. You're like, that's a little rich. I think I might be done. Mind you, I've never eaten half a cookie. So like, yeah. I've definitely eaten the whole cookie, but still it's it, the, the concept of it. 
you're not having a sleeve of cookies. You're like, oh, I had a few and I, I feel satisfied. And it's, it's great to not have it be off limits, but it's also great to like, just realize like, oh, like that, that was, that was delightful. I was actually on a coaching call with someone earlier today. We were talking about cheesecake specifically because uh, her and her husband just went out for cheesecake the other night. She had like half of it and was like, I'm done. And like, yeah, I mean, I love cheesecake, but being able to just notice those cues and being like, ah, you know what? This is plenty. I feel like that was a, a delightful treat. And like, you know, she had full permission to have a full cheesecake or a whole slice of cheesecake. Full cheesecake would maybe be a challenge, but you know, an entire yeah. slice of cheesecake, she could have done it. She wouldn't have gotten scolded. I'm not here to crack whips on people. Um, but she was just like, oh no, half was enough. And you know, that, that change in the taste, but the change in, in what tastes good veggies taste better and better as you get more used to eating veggies. Whereas if you're like, I don't know, a six-year-old kid, I've got like a little niece and nephew, they don't really love their veggies yet, but I imagine their taste buds will also change over time. You know? Yeah. No, and I need to get better at that. I I'll be honest. I rarely eat vegetables, man. I get so lazy. <laughs> I'm just trying to track. I was like, I like reverse engineer and it's like, okay, if I want this bag of gummy bears, that's 400 calories. So now I've got 20, like 2,100 to play with. So it's just like, I kind right, of just make sure I hit, I just make sure I hit that number plus my protein goal. And then it's like, I don't have to worry about overeating because like that was, that's my issue. I overeat right. and like, it's just, it, it, it can get bad. So yeah, you've kind of got like guardrails on the freeway. You're not gonna, you're not gonna go careening off the road. Uh, you, you might, you know, have some wiggle room within that, of course, but you're keeping yourself more or less honest to the goal, mm. which is huge. And funny, you mentioned, and we'll have to talk about this later, but the cheesecake, I uh, made a pro I, I made a protein cheesecake. I found a recipe. It was halfway decent, but I mean, it like, once again, I feel like it's all about, for me, it was about modifying it to like yeah, trick yeah, my yeah. brain. Like you're eating Oreo. What cheesecake. was it made out of? I'm curious. Uh, fat free, um, uh, which, uh, cream cheese, Okay. Pro protein powder. What else is in that thing? God, it was, it was a little while ago, but the Oreo, sure, sure. instead of using actual Oreo, um, we, I saved calories by using the Oreo cereal. So oh, I crushed sense. it up and like, the flavor like of it. Yeah, yeah. So you can get that little hit of Oreo. Uh, what else was in that? I've done one where you take, uh, just like Greek yogurt, mm -hmm. um, Greek yogurt was in there too. Drain it in cheesecloth until it's like the consistency of ricotta cheese. And mm. then just use that as your base, which is nice. delightful. Yeah. yeah. Um, and real quick, I did, as far as weighing, I know we talked about tracking calories, but as mm. far as weighing food, I feel like there's so many myths about it. And I have to talk to yourself and a bunch of other people so I can get a clear answer. Cause like how, it, what is the proper way to weigh food starting with like meats versus something like pasta or rice, rice, especially. <laughs> sure. I mean, the proper way to weigh any food is the way that you'll actually do it. Cause I think a lot of people might like buy a food scale and be like, okay, I'm going to weigh. Eh, that's a lot of complication. And like your aunt is doing if, if teaspoons and, and cup measurements work better, cool, do it. It's about paying attention more than it is about being perfectly accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I usually, uh, I usually weigh by grams rather than ounces. It just gives you a little bit more precision. Uh, but I'm kind of coming at this from the perspective of cooking. So my food scale has been used more to make recipes with precision accuracy yeah. rather than just to weigh my food for the sake of fitness. Um, so, so I think that's, I'm coming at it from that perspective. You get more accurate measurements for recipes if you're going to the gram. So if you're if you're doing it for fitness, if you're trying to be as accurate as possible, weighing by grams makes sense because it is, it is going to be more finely tuned than ounces. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that, there's always the debate of like, do you weigh like a piece of meat? Do you weigh it raw? Do you weigh it cooked? I mean, ultimately it kind of doesn't matter as long as you're the way you're weighing it and the way you're logging, logging it is congruent. So if you're weighing a piece of raw meat and then you cook it and you track it as a piece of cooked meat, off the raw weight, you've lost a lot of water in the cooking process. So like four ounces of raw chicken is less than four ounces of chicken once it's cooked, because that, I mean, this steam is literally water evaporating from the thing that you're eating. So the weight changes, but the amount of protein in that piece of chicken is still the same because protein isn't evaporating as you cook it. So like that can get really confusing, but it's really just being, you know, consistent in what you're like, uh, what you're yeah. weighing and what you're tracking. Same with like dry versus cooked 
for things like rice or pasta, if what you're weighing is dry, which is what I would normally do, uh, then what you're tracking is, is dry as well. And sometimes it's tricky because a lot of tracking apps don't necessarily say specifically what it's supposed to be. And so it, it can get, it can get a, a weird gray area pretty quickly yeah. if, you, if you go too far down that rabbit hole for sure. Yeah. Cause like, if you ever, <laughs> if you have it, you should look on your rice thing. I like it. It's, it feels like a standardized test, you know, I'm just yeah, like, and math is not my strong suit. Yeah. 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 No. And that's what I'm saying. I'm reading. I'm like, well, is this like cooked or is this like raw? And then it's like raw, but it's like, how would you wait? I don't know. But just to be clear though, with like meat, like if I have chicken, like I cook up chicken, do I weigh it after I got, if you were to recommend, so it's like, I need to cook the chicken or the steak or whatever poultry and then weigh it while it's cooked. Right. I usually weigh raw, Oh, okay. but that's just, that's just me. Like you could do it cooked. You just want to make sure that the entry that you're using is for cooked, whatever it is you're having. Okay. So let's say chicken breast. So like there will be a slight, like you're just going to have more protein per ounce of cooked chicken than you would of raw chicken gotcha. because it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's going to weigh less, but have the, you know, relatively the same calories and macros. Gotcha. And I noticed, like I said, you, you're doing a ton of cooking on your Instagram, man. Tell me all about that. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's what I get excited about. Cause like cooking for me, I always loved food, yeah. um, which is part of why I was a natural chubster growing up. Um, but over time I've just gotten more and more into like actual like, cooking. Um, and I'm, I, I haven't been to like culinary school or anything like that. I'm definitely self-taught, but cooking more and more and really like bringing that together with the, the coaching business and brand. So like helping people who love food be fit is kind of what I'm all about. So from like a, you know, a, a marketing and content marketing perspective, I want to hang out where the food lovers hang out digitally. Cause like one, those are my people. Uh, but two, those are the people that I would want to coach. Like, ideally, those are my favorite people to coach people that love food because I, I get along with them. Um, and I also think that so many people that love food think they can never be fit because like, oh, well, those are you know, food and fitness get pitted against each other all the time. So I want to bring those together. Uh, and then that's just, you know, that's what content creation is for me for the most part. So I'm, I'm doing, uh, you know, lots on Instagram and YouTube primarily. Uh, so, you know, reels and things like that about those quick cutting recipe videos and then longer format things on YouTube. Uh, because I want food lovers to find my stuff and I want to be someone in the food space that just so happens to coach fitness rather than someone that coaches fitness and just so happens to love food. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the big, big focus of my content, my content marketing, all that sort of jazz, but it's also just fun. I enjoy the, the process of it all, even getting in and editing stuff, having fun with that. And then just like making delicious food and sharing it with the world. Like, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, on your recent post, depending on when you're looking at your Instagram, uh, is that awesome steak and dude, yeah. I've oof, God, that looked awesome. <laughs> it was delicious. It was, it, was. <laughs> yeah. it was, it was very, very tasty. Um, yeah, that was, that one worked out nicely. Honestly, when I, I was, so I was getting ingredients. I was, I was filming a few recipes that day. I was getting ingredients and I saw the New York strips at the store and I was like, well, I can't leave those. So that wasn't even a planned recipe. That was just like, oh, well, I have to, cause it's here. And it, uh, yeah, it turned out deliciously. And I want to go into that, but before I forget how, I know you said you're on Instagram and, and YouTube, how mm -hmm. has video changed your business? I think video in a lot of ways, I, I think it's a medium that I do well in. Um, I don't know. Different people are different. I have different strengths, right? But I think I'm, I've always felt really natural and comfortable on camera. It's probably because my buddy Will and I, when we were growing up, would like do James Bond movies on the camcorder. So yeah. like, I probably have that to thank for it, but I've always felt really comfortable on camera and I can explain my point in a, in a much more succinct and clear way when I'm doing so on video, rather than if I'm just like trying to type an epic blog post, I can get into the nuance a bit better and a bit faster as well. So even with people I coach, I do video responses to their check-ins. I used to just do emails, but I'm able to get my point across better. There's less room for misunderstanding. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, the same applies to YouTube and even Instagram, especially as they started pushing reels. That was, I mean, it's just opened up a lot of opportunity there to just be able to be myself on the medium a bit better. Cause like pictures, I don't think to take pictures. I've got sisters who are great at that. They're like, oh, this would be a great picture. I just don't think of it. I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then I'm like, oh, I should have maybe taken pictures so I could post it. Uh, but videos are a lot 
easier for me to think of. And then my personality comes through more. I can make jokes in ways that I would in real life. And I think it's great. I, I think it's, uh, it's at least more fun for me, which means I'm going to do it more kind of like the fitness stuff. I'm going to do it more. And that means, you know, good things actually have the opportunity of happening over time. And do you, would you say if you had to pick between Instagram and YouTube right now, would you double down on Instagram or YouTube? That's a good question. Um, I feel like doubling down on YouTube would be my choice between the two. Um, for a handful of reasons, like one, I just feel like organic reach on Instagram isn't what it used to be, though at the same time, you could argue that organic reach on YouTube isn't what it used to be either. But uh, because YouTube essentially functions like a search engine, the longer stuff is on YouTube, the more value it has as like a, a long-term piece of content, uh, kind of like blogs back in the day, the longer it was there, the better it did with SEO and the more eyes would be on it. Whereas with an Instagram post, that's kind of a flash in the pan uh, and then it, it dies. I mean, I, I had a reel once that got attention for like a full week and I was like, what is going on? I don't understand why it's been like yeah. four days and people are still liking this. Whereas with a YouTube video four days after the fact isn't, isn't weird at all. I, you know, like I, I think for me at least, and obviously this is different for different people. I'm using Instagram to help support the YouTube channel. And I just recently decided to like put forth real effort on the YouTube channel. So it's, it's still a new thing but using Instagram to support the YouTube channel rather than the other way around. Uh, just cause I think the flash in the pan to send them off to the more long form content, uh, will over time prove more beneficial, but we'll see if my, it's just see if my bet is correct, I suppose. But that's, that's how I've felt recently is just the long-term game. I think, I think YouTube's going to help out more. I a hundred percent agree, man. And that's what I tell my clients as well, because I mean, everything you said is what I say too. Like I'm actually about to start dabbling into TikTok a little bit, but YouTube is also owned by Google. So mm -hmm. as far as security goes, like it ain't going anywhere. And kind of like you said with the long, like the longevity of it. Yeah. It's more work, but you know, I've heard, I've had clients where they've had videos on YouTube and then four or five years later, all of a sudden they wake up and something with the algorithm hit it. And like you said, it's a search engine. So people are going there every day for yeah. problems to be solved. And if, whether they're cooking steak or want to learn about YouTube or podcasts, like the problems are always going to be there for it to find. And yeah, man, no, I, Totally agree. But like I said, I wanted to cover that real quick before we got back to the food. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> back to the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and now you said you like, or that food became fun. Did, was it always like that? Because I had the opposite thing. I used to hate to cook. Like I was like, this is dumb. But then once I started traveling around for work and stuff, I kind of had to learn. And then once fitness kicked in, I was like, oh, I can do this or, oh, I can do that. And then now it's finally like, Oh, I can make protein cheesecake and have steak right. and French fries. Like, yeah. oh my gosh. That's, that's living the dream right there. Yeah. But um, so for me, I think yeah. it's been forever. Like I've just always loved food. Oh, cool. Um, so that, that was like an easy catalyst towards wanting to, like, if I want to eat delicious food, it's kind of nifty to be able to cook delicious food, but even a bit like, like a level deeper than that. I grew up playing a lot of music. Um, and as I got older, music kind of faded. I wasn't as on the forefront, but I've always been like a creative. So food for me became like the new creative avenue. Uh, and I played, I, I played bass and I particularly played and loved playing jazz. Uh, so that was like, you know, once you understand the rules, you can mm -hmm. improv within the core changes and have a lot of fun. And that's essentially what cooking became for me. And it's also why I'm not as much of a baker. Uh, so like baking to me feels more like classical music, which I played plenty of back in the day, but I didn't have as much fun doing it because there wasn't as, as much space and wiggle room to be inventive and play around. Cause it's like literal science. If you change the ingredients too much, it won't rise. And it's just mm -hmm. like, well, I don't understand those rules well enough. It's a little bit more uh, like specific of what you have yep. to do to get the finished product. Whereas cooking, you can just play around and like, yeah, there are principles. There are, you know, things like balancing flavors and, and stuff like that, that is important. But once you understand those rules, you can really start playing around in ways that, at a glance, maybe don't make sense. So for me, it's just that new creative avenue or it became that new creative avenue kind of dovetailing off of what music used to be for me. So I think that's a big reason why I have always loved it because it has been for like as long as I can remember, but I think it's kind of rooted in that same creative spark that had me loving improv baselines in like 
jazz band in middle school, like the same sort of creativity is, is being uh, utilized. And that for me is just fun. And did you, do you try and keep it as simple as possible or do you like to sometimes challenge yourself and like really kind of push those like creative limits? Uh, That would probably be where the 80, 20 rule applies. I would say 80% (laughs) of the time I'm probably eating quick, simple stuff, like making it taste good, but keeping it as simple as possible because like I'm a, I'm a normal human being. I don't have all Mm. the time in the world. I got to like do stuff. I have responsibilities, unfortunately. Um, Right. Uh, But yeah, I would say 20% of the time, it, I, yeah, I make food as crazy as I want. I'll go to a grocery store, find an ingredient that's just like, okay, I'm going to play with that. So maybe it's like, oh, I'm going to roast wild boar and make like a demi glaze to put over the top of it or whatever I'm doing, or a gastrique or just like fun, fancy terms, right? And just play around with stuff. Or, you know, uh, for me, it's always techniques that get me excited. So there are all sorts of different things out there in the food world and plenty of things I've never tried. So if I've never cooked boar, I'm like, okay, let me make something tasty with boar and I'll go like way over the top with complexity and technique there. And I might do that on like a random Sunday night or something when I've got time on my hands. And then the rest of the week, I'm just like eating normal stuff. And then other times it'll be, maybe it's like dessert. I'm like making dessert for family or friends or whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to make this one fun. So I'll make a dark chocolate soil because I've never done that. And I want to try that technique. Like, yeah. So it's mostly simple stuff, but when I have the opportunity to, to go all out, I, I relish it because it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it, cause like, I love like consuming like knowledge like that, like how to cook certain things that I almost invested in like one of those Gordon Ramsey, uh, what is it? The, those super extravagant courses that they have. I can, you know, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. I, it was I have the me. yearly subscription. I watch the food ones all the time. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But yeah. I, I watched the reviews and stuff, but all the stuff he's doing looks awesome, but man, it looks complicated. So then I found yeah, some of it can be, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot and expensive. I was doing so they're like, you know, sometimes these ingredients are like foreign and like, you don't know where the hell right. you're going to find them. But yeah, that's when I started finding other people on YouTube who like cooked with protein and stuff. And once again, I just became just super obsessed with it. Like make it, you know, like even with like potatoes, I got tired of like cooking potatoes. So I was like, okay, I'll just get frozen French fries, calculate those, and then go all out <laughs> on the steak, put the steak right, over the right. fries and just like hammer that down. Um, but one of the things that I feel like anybody who tries to start cooking healthy, or I feel like the stereotypical meal is like chicken, broccoli, and rice. And it's just sure. like, anytime I see it, I want to vomit because like, I have so many <laughs> like chicken recipes, but it has taken me. And I don't know if this is for you too, but maybe for the average person to cook a juicy piece of chicken, what is your best advice for cooking a juicy piece of chicken and not drying it out? I mean, the, the best advice is to not overcook it which most people do uh, kind of by default, right? Because we're worried about food safety. And as like a a home cook that maybe doesn't have a thermometer or things like that, we're just like, well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm going to give it a few more minutes. And we cook it into oblivion. And then we're basically eating chicken jerky rather than like chicken thigh. Um, And so I think that happens all the time. So cooking it for less time often is an easy fix. Mind you, that's a tricky game to play uh, because it's like, well, you also don't want to get sick. (laughs) Um, one, I guess, trick, this is if you're roasting a whole chicken, which I realize isn't necessarily something a lot of people are doing all the time, but you want those drumsticks to have like a real, like there should be give in the joint. And usually when there's that spot of give in the joint, you're at a spot where like things are cooked through and you want the juices running clear. And that's the case for any chicken. Uh, but yeah, if if you've got a good bit of jiggle in the joint and then when you cut into it, the juices are running clear, your chicken's done. And you basically want to be just done and not overdone, obviously. Uh, But like a a lot of that just comes with reps and getting used to it, getting used to the feel of it. I I don't necessarily use my meat thermometer very often, but for someone who's new to it and wants to get better, I think something like a meat thermometer is a great investment because like they're not that expensive, but also it's just going to help you get a feel for like, oh, this is when it's done. And you have like some data to back you up rather than just like, well, hopefully... Because I'll, I'll be honest, I, I feel bad. It was years and years ago, but I made fried chicken and waffles for some friends. This was like back in college. Um, so my my techniques were not as polished as they are now, we'll say. <laughs> um, but I do think I got somebody sick. Like she, oh, no. 
yeah, I, yeah. Like I, she was like, oh, I didn't like them because I got sick afterwards. And I was like, oh, that's probably just because I undercooked her piece of chicken. Mind yeah. you, it was technically, I will make the waffles. Everybody bring your own fried chicken. That was the nature of the party. So I was like, a, a handful of people wanted me to fry them chicken. And I was, I was caught up in the moment. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. But I think I just took on a bit more than I could chew with that particular get together. Uh, but I've always felt bad. And that was like, I don't know, back in 2012. So it's, it's been a while, but I still like that's in the back of the mind. Like I do think I undercooked chicken that one time. So it does happen. It can happen. And meat thermometers would have solved that in an instant. I would have known like, Oh, Hey, maybe don't eat that. Yeah, no. And it, and honestly, like I use my meat thermometer. I spent a little extra money. They run anywhere between, I think like 60 or nine, almost a hundred bucks, depending on which one you get. But I have a Bluetooth one. I think Uh, it's by by meter. I'll actually link it up in the description below if you'd like one. Um, But dude, this thing. So I found there's a one guy I follow on YouTube uh, because like I said, dude, I have tried chicken so many different ways and it kills me because it's just not as great. And I guess he found an article by the FDA because, uh, for like the longest time, chicken's got to be 165 degrees. Apparently the FDA is saying that it's 155. So for a lot, for like the longest time, I would take it out at 165, mm. but then like steaks, like it's still cooking. So yeah. this guy, so well, you have this carry over because the mm-hmm. outside is very hot. The inside is less warm. Even if you take it out when the internal, like the middle temp is 165, the outside might be more like 175 and that's going to even out over time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I just took like the biggest piece of chicken. I cleaned it. I used to not clean chicken until I, I was like, ah, oh, that's too much work. And then I actually cleaned it one time and saw the gunk that came off. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I was like, I'm eating that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I put the thermometer through it, through the piece of chicken and cooked it. I think at like, I think at like 350 or 400, which sounds high because it's not dense and it's chicken, but dude, I pulled it as soon as it hit like 135, 137, pulled it out and it jumped about 10 degrees or just like, you know, cause it's still cooking. Yeah. And then it hit 155, bro. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, like you learn to love chicken again. Cause it's just like, I, I just remember like getting into fitness or just when people first start, it's like that standard meal. And I see people eating it all the time. And I'm like, that is disgusting. And yeah, it's it just like quick. Yeah. And people's ovens are different too. I didn't know that. Sure. Like everybody's ovens are different. So yeah, man. And finally, when you get that like actual juicy piece of chicken, it makes you love chicken again. <laughs> oh, for sure. And that's, that's actually a, a fun little fact, mind you, from like a health and fitness perspective, it is a little bit more calorically dense because it has more fat, but chicken thighs are a bit more forgiving than chicken breast as mm-hmm. you're trying to like get your reps in and get like good juicy chicken cooked. Thighs are always going to be a bit more forgiving in, in large part because of the fattiness that they have. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's easier to get a juicy thigh than it is to get a juicy breast. Yeah, I yeah. Sounds like a a meme all of a sudden. But you know (laughs) we're gonna get clipped here on the internet for a little bit. (laughs) But man, I want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate you uh appreciate you coming on and dropping your knowledge and everything like that. Uh where can people find you online? So I would say the the two best places are that YouTube channel and the Instagram. So I am the coach that cooks on Instagram. Uh, so that, that one's usually pretty easy. It used to be something else. And I've, I've never been so excited about a name change on Instagram. Cause it's like, Oh, that's, that's perfect. So the coach that cooks on Instagram and then on YouTube, it is the fitness for food lovers channel. So fitness for food lovers, it should pop right up. Uh, and yeah, the, the steak video, uh, or the video for the steak picture that you were referring to is, is up there. And then I have a topping on it, a little gremolata that's in the midst of edits right now. So, uh, that'll be coming out soon enough. Uh, but yeah, both those places I am quite active on and always happy to be helpful. If people have questions about cooking or fitness, uh, my DMs are basically Denny's. They're always open so people can slide on in, ask questions, and, and I'm always happy to help people out. Yep. So whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're just listening to it, I'll link all of his links down below. And usually my last question is, if you could only create one more piece of video content, what would it be and why? But since this is almost like a cooking aspect, if you could, uh, if you could only cook one last meal, what would it be and why? That is a great question. 
I feel like I would have to go in a nostalgia direction. Um, so I was involved with uh, season 10 of MasterChef uh, a handful of years ago, and I had to create a sign- signature dish for that. And the signature dish I made was paying homage to both my grandmothers. So one grandmother always dipped pork chops in applesauce, and then the other grandmother made this uh, like pickled cucumber salad. It was basically just cucumbers sliced up and then you soak them in vinegar for a little while. Uh, and so I, I took that and made it classy. So it's like a spice rub pork tenderloin over an apple cauliflower puree, and then a like maple bourbon pickled cucumber salad as like a side dish to it. So I feel like if that was the, the last meal I had to cook, it would probably be that. And then I'd, I'd probably do a, a PB and J brulee is a creme brulee recipe I made up that tastes like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's delightful. So that'd probably be dessert for my last meal as well. But that's probably the direction I'd go. A little hat tip to both my grandmothers. And it's just, it's downright delicious. So that we'll, 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 we'll go with that. That's, I was nervous as you started asking, but I feel good about my answer. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, like I said, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. This has been fun.